Hey folks, Steve here, and uh, it's 11.59, I'm a minute early, but uh, thank you for joining the Alien Guitar Secrets little uh, webinar I'm doing here, question and answers. I, I kind of felt it was nice to be able to reach out, and uh, I'm actually doing it from the Harmony Hut in Encino, which is my studio, you can kind of see in the background there. And uh, I have on the phone here, Stephen Bradley, you there, Steve? Yep. Okay, Stephen is my, Stephen and Stephanie are my amazing social media team that you guys, uh, uh, actually every time I post or do anything, it goes through them. So uh, yesterday was nice. I tried this out for the first time and it seemed to work pretty well. So um, I guess you're there. And a lot of really great response from yesterday. Thanks a lot. I got a lot of questions and what I wanted to do here is kind of uh, spend some time uh, talking about guitar, music, these kinds of things that you're interested in. I know a lot of times I have a tendency to uh, kind of go a little deeper than just the um, surface of playing the guitar, you know, the academics, the scales, the theory. Uh, so I decided it might be a good idea to actually create a couple of different types of webinars and one of them focusing more on <clears throat> the guitar and music and, and uh, another one focusing more on some of the deeper principles, which I just can't help to get into anyway. So <laughs> here we go. And I have some great questions. First, I think uh, I'll give you a little update on what I'm up to here, uh, what I've been up to. Um, I don't know. It seems like every time I plan something, another compelling idea comes along that I feel like I got to go chase. And one of the most compelling uh, projects that is, have been <clears throat> on my mind for as long as I can remember was uh, writing orchestra music. Uh, it was something that uh, appealed to me in the very, very, very beginning, long before the guitar, actually. It was just the concept of it. Uh, it seemed to make sense to me when I was very young and I saw the, hey guys, sorry, my gardeners, they're working, thank God. <laughs> and uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, and I started learning composition and would doodle all sorts of little notes and stuff and eventually started composing. A lot of you know the story. <clears throat> it's very difficult through the years to get your music performed by an orchestra. I was so fortunate to have a very good friend in the Netherlands, Coda Clue who is the creative callous, uh, catalyst that has basically pioneered my orchestra music. And back, I think it was 2005, we uh, did some great projects with the Metropole Orchestra and that turned into sound theories and visual sound theories, which was my orchestra records. So I had about three and a half to four hours of orchestra music on the shelf that I've had performed in various ways through the years, uh, very dense contemporary, abstract, all that crazy stuff. And uh, I just love doing it. And uh, <clears throat> I wrote a bunch of pieces and had them performed. After the situation with Co, uh, more orchestras were interested in performing my music, which was fantastic. It was very difficult to kind of break into that, uh, you know, that field, that, that uh, family, so to speak. And uh, it was great. I've played with so many orchestras around the world now. But I decided I wanted to take this music and, and fix the wrong notes, add some parts, take some parts out, and then record the stuff properly in the studio. So actually, uh, that's what I've been working on for months and months, and that's what I'm working on now, all day and night, and I love it. Um, and we're planning on going in the studio uh, in the last week of May, this May, uh, with uh, the Metropole Orchestra in Holland, and then the first two weeks of June with the Aarhus Denmark Radio Orchestra. Now, are these things going to happen? Who knows? Uh, because, as you know, everything is changing, and that and that's fine. You know, we all are making massive adjustments right now, and perhaps even making some interesting discoveries uh, based on this situation we're in right now. I think it's one of the first times I've actually felt joined at the hip with the entire world on something that transcends borders, 
religions, politics, sexes, all these things. We're kind of like all in it together. Uh, and I think we're doing pretty well as best as we can. All right. So that's what I'm up to. And then uh, regar uh, regarding what happens there, I'll probably be jumping back in to working on my next record. I know I get it. I, I know. Don't, don't ask. Don't ask. I'm so sorry. It's taking so long. A lot of other things just kind of come along that are interesting and exciting to do. Uh, okay. So what do we got here? Steve, you got these questions? The, the, I know the yeah. ones that Stephanie pulled are pretty similar. Okay, Steve, one question for me would be, do you know during Bad Horsey Live in the Astoria version when you start chucking the guitar around your head, how does it make the sounds when you move the guitar? Ah, that's a secret. <laughs> Actually, what I did when I did that, I, I, I created, the whole thing was created in my mind first. And what I did was I, I saw myself on the stage or I saw a, a person, a performer in my mind, just doing something unnatural, you know, with, with the instrument, uh, uh, almost like a wizard, you know, throwing the guitar around. And there's two pieces that I, I kind of did like this. The Bad Horsey from the Astoria is one of them. And the other is something called Dancing in the Abyss, which was taken from the murder from the uh, Where the Wild Things Are tour. And what I do was, what I did was I, I visualized all the movements. Now, the sounds that come out of the guitar are virtually uncontrollable when you're wielding the instrument and it's making all these noises. And a lot of times uh, what I would do is whatever sound the guitar made at that point that I was holding it, I would work that into an orchestration. I'd, I'd work that into the song with overdubs. So it was a live performance. And if you saw me doing it live, you wouldn't be hearing all the things that are coming out of the guitar. Not all, you'd hear many of them, but you wouldn't hear a lot of this stuff because I actually overdubbed it to create these this almost instant kind of uh, har harmonies. Because when the guitar is feeding back a particular note, and all of a sudden these huge harmonies come in on it, it gives it an unearthly kind of interesting, odd vibe. So there's some acting involved, obviously. Uh, that was the fun part. Because being on the stage, or if you watch my actions in those videos, they're pretty free, you know, and they're pretty bold. Uh, and then I would take, then I took the audio and the visual and used whatever I could in regards to the sounds that came out of the guitar, but in some instances actually went in and overdubbed. So I cheated. I cheat a lot. You have no idea how much I cheat. <laughs> Hey, it's art, but it's a cool visual. And if you get a chance to check it out, um, the uh, Dancing in the Abyss is just, I love watching it. I, I see it and I think people uh, get the impression that that's my idea of a guitar instrumental song. It, it's not. It's my idea of art in motion. <laughs> so there you go. What else? Hi, Steve. Hi from Australia. Love your music. Thank you. I saw you with DLR on Skyscraper Tour in Melbourne back in 1988. I remember that tour. Please keep us with your Facebook Live during these lockdowns. Okay, I'll do my best. <clears throat> I remember that tour. Can I tell you a funny story about that tour? I, <laughs> I usually don't tell these kind of stories, but uh, I was on tour with Dave Roth and we were on, in South America, uh, in uh, Australia. And it was great because it was the first time <clears throat> we had been there. <clears throat> It might have even been the first time I was there. Yeah, I think it was. And uh, the last night after the last show, we decided to go out and party, Dave and I. So we got into a limo and we drove someplace and partied. And since it was the end of the tour and there wasn't much to lose, I drank. <laughs> we both did. It, we both drank a lot. And uh, I don't usually do that, but back then, every now and then. And uh, we were driving back to the hotel and it was me and Dave in the limo with a the, with the girl that he uh, had met. <laughs> and we were drunk, man, we were sick. And it was so funny because I think the, uh, the limo driver kind of knew this. So he was kind of taking the piss out of us by, you know, steering and, and you know, getting us a little sick. And we're kind of like falling around the back of this car. And it was so 
un, unnerving, you know, being drunk and being thrown around that we just started to projectile vomit. <laughs> At least that's what I remember. And it was all over the place. I mean, it was like the exorcist on, uh, on steroids. Which is, you don't want to know how we felt in the morning. But the funny thing was, we got up in the morning and we had to leave for the airport like two hours after we got back. And there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of limos in Australia at the time where we were. So I guess they had to use the same limo. So they took it back and they tried cleaning it as best they can. <laughs> and it was hot out. So I remember getting back into the limo. We're just like sick and we're getting to the airport. It was fine because we were going home. You know, something, something about the last show going home, you know. And I remember thinking we're all in the, this car and it was just something wasn't right. And it looked pretty clean, you know, but I'm just looking around. Says, what is this? It was so gross. And it's like the driver says, roll up the windows. I'll turn on the air conditioning. Maybe that'll help. I don't know. So <laughs> I'm sitting there leaning against the door and I roll up the window. And I guess when they cleaned the car, they cleaned everything but the windows. <laughs> so you could probably figure out the rest. Anyway, that was my little uh, adventure first time in Australia. What that has to do with the guitar, nothing. <laughs> but I figure maybe you'd get a kick out of that story. I've got so many of them. All right, I should write a book, but I won't. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hello from New York. Advice for someone who feels like they don't fit or sound similar to today's guitarists' shredders. Thank you for everything you've done for these lockdowns. Oh, done for music. Um, well, congratulations. I don't think it's necessary to feel like all the other shredders. This is, uh, this is vital to understand because then you're always predisposing your own instincts. You're always kind trying to uh, uh, usurp your own instincts because you're seeing what somebody else is doing and feeling that I should be doing that because that's what's popular or that's what's trendy. And you might actually be interested in shredding and, and that's fine. Um, <clears throat> but it's not necessarily, uh, it's not necessary if you're not interested in it. So the, the important thing is that you're able to get in touch with what it is in you that you like to do and embrace that embrace that and the feeling of feeling different use that to your advantage because everybody's unique creative nature is different and if you're not following it you're never going to find f real fulfillment because that's that feeling of fulfillment that comes from expressing your unique creativity is the real payoff it's a lot nicer than the egoic payoff of being able to play faster than someone else or something like that. Oh, excuse me. And um, <clears throat> so embrace that and realize that diversity, although, although many times the world view, the world views diversity as something alien sometimes, you know, many, Many people feel that there is a status quo and they need to meet that and that what they feel attracted to in the form of anything, food, religion, politics, their sexual um, uh, perspectives or whatever, uh, you'll notice something and that's that there's an incredible amount of diversity. As a matter of fact, and I guess this is a probably a good discussion for Thursdays under it all, but um, no two people have the same perspective on anything. No two living things have the same perspective. But the human ego kind of believes that their perspective is the correct one. <laughs> so when you can do away with that and realize the, the incredible uh, advantage of the diversity that surrounds you, if you can appreciate the diversity in other players, this will serve you really well. This, because it changes, it, it, imagine the feeling, uh, imagine the feeling of 
what did you write here? Mm, being feeling left out or not fitting in, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, feeling uh, that your contribution isn't up to snuff or something. What does that feel like to you? It feels pretty bad. It's a form of suffering. Now compare that feeling with the feeling of looking into the world and seeing the diversity. And since we're talking about guitars, guitar playing and appreciating that diversity and realizing that it's actually there for you. It's there for your inspiration. It, there's so many different types of players that no one's right or wrong. They're just following their bliss and you deserve to follow your bliss. And when you look into the world at other players that are perhaps doing things that you feel are impossible for you, but you'd like to do, then use them as inspirations. You know, you use them as inspirations. Uh, I've always had a weird kind of a feeling about competition um, because I've always felt that uh, the only person you're ever actually in reality competing with is yourself because that's all you can compete with really is upping your own game from one level to another and the diversity that's going on outside of you can be a great inspiration so it's very rare that you might hear a coach uh, tell a basketball team you guys when you go out there i want you to remember one thing you're not competing with the other team and you're not competing with each other. You can only ever compete with yourself to make yourself better. And everybody else is an opportunity to help you do that, whether you beat them or not. You can only ever do your best. So if you come across, if well, I'm still being the coach. So if you get out there and you're doing your best and you lose, you did your best and you can be angry at the opponents. You can criticize them or you can use them as an inspiration and to see how you can continue to up your game. So try that with the guitar and uh, see how that feels. It feels much better than feeling shut out and out of place and not fitting in. Good, good that you feel that way. I really think that you can use that to your advantage. Um, okay. I'm noticing that the screen is Steve. Steve, yeah. you there? I'm noticing the screen yeah. is kind of like uh, colors are going on and off. Is that just because let me try shutting this. I don't know. Maybe that'll be better. Okay. Yeah. It could be just the ISO on your camera adjusting the yeah. light changes. Okay. Oh, it looks okay. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Greetings, Maestro. Hopefully you're doing well. I am I'm doing very well. Thank you. And I can only hope the same for you and everybody else at this time. But uh, yeah, we're doing good. We're my wife and I in this big house and our boys are across town. Uh, they actually live together in Studio City and uh, it's quiet. <laughs> All right. Have you had moments where you feel there's no creativity or inspiration to compose? And if so, how often? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think dry spells are relatively common for us mere mortals. <laughs> I know few people that are inspired all the time. Uh, Frank Zappa was one of them. Um, but I think the most important thing to, and yes, I have, I have dry spells too. And I can, I can share with you what I do during those periods to keep my confidence up and to keep the creativity flowing as best it can. And maybe some of these things can help you. First of all, don't worry. <laughs> I know that's a big statement, but it's the most important one that I think our creativity has a natural ebb and flow to it. And, um, it's kind of like when it's, when it's up, it's up. And when it's down, it, it, it actually feels, it can feel when you're in a dry spell, if, if you let the mind get a hold of it, 
it'll start saying things to you like you lost your mojo. You, you don't have it anymore. It's not going to come back. Uh, and then, and, and, and that obviously engenders fear, worry, and also it leads to other thoughts like, you know, it's, it's the law of attraction, basically that whatever thought you're thinking attracts more thoughts like it. This is not mumbo jumbo. You can kind of prove this in the laboratory of your own mind, you know, look at the thoughts you're thinking. And the more you hold on to them, you build a commentary and you build a story in your head about it. And then those extra added thoughts are in the direction of the quality that you're heading. So if you're heading towards uh, negative feeling thoughts, you're only going to produce more of them. And the next thing you know, the thoughts might come to you like, well, maybe none of my work was ever inspired. Maybe I've never was inspired. Maybe everything I do sucks. This is nonsense. And I hopefully you'll be able to see when your mind is doing that and not buy into it. Here's some replacement thoughts that might be helpful. Uh, it's a natural curve, the ebb and flow of creativity, I believe. And I like to look at it like this because this is something that I've discovered that might be helpful to you. It's sort of like when you're when you're in the when you're in the low spot, the dry spell, so to speak. Tell yourself um, it's time for your creative muscle to, to take a rest. It's just resting. Actually, that's what it's doing. You're you're gathering. It's kind of gathering its momentum as the dry spell is 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 uh, happening, and it's getting ready to blow. And that's what you're. That will happen for you if that's your expectation, but it has to be an authentic expectation and anything that you believe is going to be real for you and must manifest. <laughs> so that's a lovely way to look at it. I'm just chilling out right now. Everything's fine. And I know when it, when she blows, she's going to blow and I better be ready because when inspiration hits, it comes fast and hard and you, you want to be ready for that and you want to capture it in any way you can. And when that inspiration comes to you, you really have to experiment with putting aside all of these uh, preconceived ideas that your idea is not good enough because you don't, sometimes we, we don't recognize the energy that's in our own creative nature. Everybody has the ability to be uniquely inspired. Not that, I mean, we are, you know, so a lot of times those ideas start to start to come up in you and you might feel an impulse to capture it somehow. I've been doing this for since I was 13 years old and I was playing the accordion. <laughs> I have it on cassette. Yeah. So I'm always capturing inspiration whenever I can. I, I talk about this a lot, and uh, one of the great ways is with iPhone or with any kind of simple little thing that you have. And you just kind of, you relax on it, and you let, the, you know when you're doing something that has an energy in it, you, could, you can kind of feel it. There's like a, there's like little aha moments, and there's, there's enthusiasm in it, you know? It's an, the enthusiasm is for your own good ideas. And, and this is vital, you, this, you're totally worthy of this, and it's happening. You have to recognize when it's happening and have faith in it. And, and try to capture in those moments any, any, any little thing you're doing that has that energy in it. Uh, I mean, I do this every night, base, every day. Uh, let me see, I got, I'll play you one I did, let me see. And it doesn't matter what it sounds like, you, you, you know, you have to search you're searching. Most of the songs of mine that you hear come that way. You know, they, they come from connecting and searching with the melody and the instrument, all, all kind of like in an organic listening inside. Uh, I mean, I can go on and on about that, but you got to kind of step out of the way and let it, let it flow. And what I mean by that stepping out of the way is the only thing that gets in the way is your, 
negative thoughts about what you're doing. So you may come up with something that's, that's fulfilling for you. It's got some energy in it for you. And then the mind will come in and say things like, yeah, but you can't do this. This is, you know, this isn't what everybody's doing. This isn't going to make you famous. This isn't uh, how you're going to, you're going to fail at this or you're not going to fit in. And this is your ego and it's a lie. (laughs) And you have to recognize the lie in it and allow yourself honor Allow yourself to honor your own creative nature. You, this is what you're, you're here for. So, and it doesn't matter uh, so much you, uh, what, what it is you're doing as opposed to what the rest of the world might think about it. You don't know. You, don't, you just don't know these things. So why let them slow you down? So here's one little thing. I don't know what it is, but I recorded it the other night. Let me see. What is it? I don't think you can hear it. Now, I think maybe because I have Stephen on the other line, it's not coming out or I'm doing something wrong, which would be so unlike me. <laughs> uh, anyway. Okay. Oh, I can hear it, though. I remember this one. Yeah, it's coming through the stream. You can hear it. Can, can you hear it okay? Yeah. Yeah, but you can't really. Anyway, the point is, let me shut it off. Hang on. Anyway, the point is, it sounds like a mess. I'm, I'm falling all over the place while I'm doing it. I mean, with my fingers, trying to find, following my ear, and it's fantastic. I listen to it now, and it's just like me sitting by the side of my bed with an electric guitar not plugged in or anything on my iPhone. I've got hundreds of these things on the infinity shelf. But when I hear that, the whole song is done. The, I, I see the whole thing. And you can do this. You, you absolutely can. It's, it's the gift of visualization, imagination, and it's endless and it's infinite. And it's a gift that you have. <laughs> Use it. I, I say this, um, don't underestimate the power of your own inspiration. Now, one of the good things about capturing even just a little snippet of something when you're feeling that resonating through you is if you're in a dry spell, it's nice to go back and have a little library of these snippets of ideas because the moment you listen to it, if you're in the right headspace, that inspiration will come right back to you and that that piece of music will just be there again for you. So you're, So this is something that you can do during a dry spell. A lot of times we believe we're going through dry spells, but it's just frustration. It's impatience. Impatience and frustration will cut at the root of your ability to find uh, your, uh, your uniquely creative ideas. I say the same thing all the time, just different ways. (laughs) And I'll probably continue to say that. So, Try that. See how that helps. Remember, it's all um, it's all up to you. It's based on your perspective, which you are in control of. Most people don't believe that. They think that the outside world rules their life. Uh, this is another illusion <clears throat> because you have the freedom to think any thought you want. You can decide to make your dry period a respite, a moment of peace moment of allowing your creative muscle to repair and get strong and get ready to start lifting again. Okay. I see a lot of questions coming in too. They're going too fast. So I'm going to stick to my, these ones I pulled. Hello, best advice for take the most from our practice sessions. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, you will always get the most out of your practicing when you're enjoying it. Uh, a lot of people believe that I uh, have had to employ 
a tremendous amount of discipline in my life to practice as much of I, as I practiced when I was younger and the way, you know, the way that I, I work sometimes, oh, you're so disciplined. And uh, that always felt kind of odd to me. And, and when I took a closer look at it, I realized uh, I'm actually not very disciplined. <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I can only do what I really want to do. Uh, I've, I've surrendered to my instincts whenever they're clear enough. And uh, as a result, um, hang on one second. Uh, as a result, I put in all these hours practicing because it was my passion. It was a joy. So see if you can, in your mind and in your words, replace the word passion with the word discipline. Because discipline has in it the, the feeling that you, you have to do something. You have to, uh, you have to put forth energy and you have to almost like fight. You have to you gotta, you gotta fight to stick with it, you know? And um, perhaps at times a little bit of that is helpful, but passion is very different. When you're in a state of passion, there's no discipline necessary because everything is enjoyable. You don't want to stop. You, 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 things start connecting in, in the state of passion when you're creating obstacles turn into opportunities there are no obstacles because you're so focused nothing is going to stop you that's what passion does and as a matter of fact um and someone might say well, what do you mean you, you need to you need to be disciplined you need to and 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 if you're working you can be in a state of passion and the whole thing can go to hell because some of the components didn't come together i don't believe so uh because when you're in that state there's an enthusiasm and there's joy and there's clarity and there's communicative uh, uh abilities with co-creators around you you're working with just the right people when, when, when uh, an obstacle or a, a problem comes up, the state of passion looks at it and says, how can I use this to get to where I want to go? A state of discipline just fights it and fights it and, and many times can be crippled by it. And, uh, but when you look at obstacles and you ask yourself, it, it, this is the key you have to ask yourself sincerely and authentically it's you can't give yourself lip service <laughs> you have to really be sincere and say okay this situation looks as though everything is going to go to hell in a handbag it, it, this situation looks as though that person is blocking my ability to do what i need to do okay so in that situation, can you ask yourself, how can I use this to my benefit? How can I see this as an advantage somehow? Now, the moment you do that, you will see it because your whole perspective is changing. And it might be that you needed to go through this thing that failed in order to find the relationships or the inspiration or the co-creative uh, um, elements to continue in a, in, a, in a more powerful way towards your goal. But you can see how that can easily be crippled and cut at the root if when a problem arises, you just give up. That's it. And, and then in that kind of a situation, then there's blame and then you're off, you're gone, forget it, pack it in. <laughs> so it's a shift. It's a shift in a perspective to ask yourself, how can I, you know, how can I make lemonade out of lemons here? But the moment you do that, your, your radar is looking for solutions. 
and you'll find them because they're there. So that's uh, maybe a little helpful. <laughs> okay. So to make the most out of your practice session, uh, play things that you enjoy. Play things that you want to, uh, uh, you know, chip away at to achieve a certain technique or, but do, do only those things that, you, that, you're, uh, that you're drawn to. You know, it's funny, I say, uh, I, I, I made a quote in an interview once, and boy, did I have to answer for it. And what I said was, uh, I don't really focus on my weaknesses. I ignore them and I focus on my strengths. Well, um, what I mean by that is uh, my strengths are the things that I find really appealing, the things that I I find in myself that I really enjoy doing. There's a path that I'm following with my creativity that's, that's it uncovers these little treasures for me every time. And you know what that feels like. You've done that. And, uh, and it's, it's a, it's a lovely feeling. And when I'm uncovering these little treasures, I'm really enjoying it. And that's what, that's a strength. So within my strengths, there are weaknesses and I work on those, you know, but one might consider, well, if you're a great guitar player, you need to know jazz, you need to know classical, you need to be a great blues player and all this stuff. Uh, well, that would be my weakness. <laughs> and I don't pay any attention to them because I like jazz and I like blues and I authentic kinds of blues and, and I like classical. And I can kind of, you know, chip away a little bit at that stuff, but it doesn't, for, it's just not my calling in life, you know? And I'm not going to make it my calling because it's more popular than what I'm doing. See, that answers the, what, the first question. You got to find what's interesting to you and throw yourself into it without any excuses. It'll make you very happy. <laughs> and uh, um, so if you're doing that in your practice session, you're going to put your head down and you're going to pick it up and you're not even going to realize how much time went by because that you'll be in the state of, of, of enthusiasm and passion. And that's the now there's no time in the now. That's why it seems like when you're completely engaged in something that time passes, like, well, you know, what happened, you know, to that five hours, you know? So this is a good thing. It's a great place to be. It's better than having a minute feel like an hour. That's discipline. <laughs> okay, what else do we got? How's it going, Steve? Good. Good? All right. Yeah, great. What music do you like to let? Ah, what advice would you have for someone who recently had wrist surgery to get back up to speed with the, where they were originally? Okay. What advice would you have for someone who recently had wrist surgery to get back up to speed with where they were originally? Well, I don't think you need my advice for that. <laughs> uh, obviously, the first thing you want to do is be friendly to your body and let it heal and be patient. Um, it's, it can be difficult, especially when you want to get back and you want to play. It's like a bodybuilder that has a competition coming up and they're working out and they're working out and then they hurt themselves and they can't work out. It's a bummer. But just like many things that uh, get rescheduled, <laughs> uh, don't worry about that stuff. You know, try not to try not to worry so much about that, uh, about having to work when your body is healing. Uh, some of the things that uh, might be very helpful in the healing process is um, allow it to happen, be friendly with it, uh, acknowledge it and, and cultivate it even, uh, meaning uh, g give it your attention. If you sit it's like a meditation. You sit and you get, let's say it's, I don't know which uh, wrist, but uh, let's say it's your right wrist. And I, I go through these things, you know, we all, maybe I haven't had surgery, <laughs> you know, but um, uh, there's challenges when you're a guitar player or anybody with wrists and fingers and carpal tunnel and this, that, and the other thing. And, and in the past, in my younger days, I was very impatient, very frustrated when these things would happen and not give them the care that they deserved, and it never really worked. Uh, 
I couldn't discipline my way through it. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that can help is uh, relaxing and kind of putting your attention, giving, giving, giving the, the point on your body that needs to heal, give it your attention. Now, what does that mean? Uh, you look at it? No, not necessarily. But you feel it from the inside. You, if, you, if you close your eyes and you put all your attention into your wrist, into the energy field in your wrist, um, you'll, you'll actually, you'll maybe feel the pain, uh, but it transforms from pain to something else. And by giving it your relaxed attention and uh, relaxing with it, th th your body loves this because it helps it heal. Now, another thing you can do on your downtime is uh, a lot of other musical things that can improve your playing that don't even require you to touch the guitar. Here's a really good one that I, I still do this. I love doing this. I've done it for years. It's, it's difficult, but it takes practice and it takes real focus, but uh, it's incredible. Try this out. Uh, when you go to sleep and you're laying in bed, um, close your eyes, clear, relax your body, blah, blah, and uh, visualize, actually visualize yourself playing and listen, you, you listen audibly and visually and only play what you're capable of hearing with your own ear in your, in, with, your, with the fingers that are playing in your mind. <laughs> okay, so for instance, I know it sounds a little odd. Let me see, what do I got here? Got my gold Pia. That's what I got. Isn't it beauty? Yeah, baby. <laughs> okay, so if I'm laying in bed and I'm kind of imagining the guitar neck in my mind, and I'm hearing something like. Uh, uh, can you hear that, Steve? Is that coming through? Yeah, it okay. sounds good on the stream. Okay, so those notes that I just played, I could see my fingers doing that in my mind and listen, I, I can hear it if, if I'm laying there at night and I'm sleeping. And But for, you know, for some people, they may not be able to, to actually see and hear that. So you got to start easy. And even okay. if you just know two notes, if you can connect in your mind, seeing yourself play those notes and hearing the notes that are correct come out, this is incredible practice because you're connecting with your inner ear and you're strengthening it. You're strengthening, strengthening it in, in your mind, which in some sense is not different than picking up the guitar and play, actually playing it. So I'm, I'm just playing, but I'm, I'm following it in my mind. You know, I can go and I'm seeing it. And, and, and many of you already know, like simple, like, you know, if you're going you know, your blues scale. I mean, by now, you know what it's going to sound like in your mind if you're looking at the, the, the neck. You know, the, the, the key of A, blues. So if those are the only two notes you can picture, you hold on to that and you just go with it. And you know that if you go, it's going to sound like that. And if you're not sure and you're still awake, just get up and go play it on the guitar and see if you're correct. <laughs> and then it, it expands. It expands. And then you can have chords based on the, how trained your ears are. You can have chords going through your, your mind. And this, this creates an incredible connection between your inner ear and your instrument. And this will benefit you when you play exponentially, exponentially it'll help you. It's a practice, it takes, it takes uh, discipline. 
<laughs> well, yeah, maybe it does. You got to keep pulling your mind back to that visual. And then you can do all sorts of crazy things with yourself and your mind. You could see yourself doing things that you wouldn't dream of doing live because you'd be afraid you don't fit in. <laughs> uh, but that's the laboratory of your own creative expression. And it's, it's your best friend because when you get comfortable in that zone of the freedom of expressing yourself, that's addictive. It's incredibly rewarding and it's very rewarding for those who resonate with it that are around you. Um, so try that. Uh, okay. What advice were you going to recently? Oh, so when it comes time that you can start moving your hands again, uh, I know it's difficult. I really do, but be gentle, you know, start slow again and and make sure it sounds good to you and slowly work within the your instincts if, you, if you're doing something there's pain that's that's good you know um and there's pain that's bad and you know the difference you know um i like the good pain for me is after i've played a whole lot and my hands hurt i love that there's nothing wrong with them they're just beat to hell you know but uh, sprain, uh, spraining your ankle when you're running, that pain is telling you something different than sore leg muscles from running. So keep your attention on that. Now, there are situations where a person who maybe even makes their living with their instrument or doing some kind of uh, modality um, has an accident and may never recover from uh, where they may never recover back to where they were. This is possible. Um, th this is where acceptance needs to come in. You need to actually accept. Uh, I mean, I'm, and I'm talking about, um, I mean, if you got three of your, God forbid, you know, like your fingers got broken off or something. Uh, or you just lost feel. Let's say you lost. Feel. Well, let's let's use an extreme example. Let's say that you developed a disease that started to paralyze your body to the point where your muscles started to atrophy and you lost control of them <clears throat> and you didn't have any uh, ability at some point to even move a muscle. And before all this, you were an accomplished, experienced, well-received, incredible virtuoso. And now there you are laying in a bed and let's take like a scenario where all you can do is move your eyes and no other part of your body. Now, that is an incredible rest uh, uh, restriction. And some of you may know who I'm talking about because this particular thing has happened to Jason Becker, who was, matter of fact, Jason, many of you know who Jason is. He was a, uh, uh, well, he played guitar. He actually uh, took over my spot in David Lee Roth's band and he was the, one of the most fascinating shredders, one of the early, early generations of new shredders that really broke open, I believe, what's what's happening even today. I shredded, but different, you know. <laughs> um, but Jason, oh my God, what an example of passion. This guy had lost all of his ability to return to playing the guitar, but he still makes incredible music. This is the will of the human spirit, and it's very well presented in Jason Becker. He is an, a, a, an historical example of what it means in the face of the most incredible limitations to rise above 
and be creative in a profound way. And I, I'm fortunate enough to have uh, been able to contribute a little bit to his last record, which he created by developing this series of communications with his father by moving his eyes. It's fascinating. I highly recommend you check it out. So the moral of the story is wherever you're at, accept it and know that there's always something you can do that's, that, can, that can fulfill you on a creative level. And uh, having said that, I hope you regain all of your shreddability back. All right. Okay. Have you ever attempted to do artificial harmonics while sweeping? Haven't seen anybody do it. MAB said it's impossible. I've got it down. All right. Good for you. Sweeping on harmonics. I'm not quite sure what kind of harmonics you're referring to, but if they're pinch harmonics, then you'd sort of be like... I, those are harmonics. You're going to get a kind of, uh, I guess, because when you, when you find a harmonic, a pinch harmonic... See, they're all different. But if I, but if I can, if you find a harmonic, say here, and then you you move your down a whole step to get the same harmonic, you got to move the position of this. So if I was to do a sweep harmonic, I would assume that I would probably find this harmonic here. And as your sweep harmonic. <laughs> but but there's also these kinds of harmonics. So you can sweep those too. I'm sure Jeff Beck could do this really well. <laughs> so something like that. I'd have to work on it. But that's a cool idea. Thank you for showing it to us. <laughs> what is the ultimate guitar routine? Should I practice the same thing every day or pick a different technique every day? Well, it's it's that's based on what your goals are. Uh, sometimes uh, I like to pick a particular technique and focus on it until I feel like it's comfortable within me and then move to another kind of technique. Um, but uh, I would say, uh, it goes back to my esoteric self, <laughs> try to find a moment and uh, to be kind of still and still in your in your mind and ask yourself what do you like most about playing the guitar what is it that inspires you what do you what do you see yourself doing that you believe would feel really good to you you know if you ask that question and you leave a space for an answer chances are it will come uh and if your if the inner dialogue isn't polluting it or chopping at the root of it, it'll arise in you as as enthusiasm. So then, within that idea, there's many things that you can break down and work on as techniques. You know, uh, let's just say um, you did that little exercise and you realize that what I really want to do is be a really great jazz guitar uh, player. And I want to be able to play uh, complete compositions in chord leading and chord voicings and chord soloing and make it sound really great. I, I know that feeling. I, I, I was fascinated with that stuff back when I was in high school. And I spent a lot of time. I actually took lessons from this, this guy, Joe Bell. He was fantastic. He, 
was my jazz guitar teacher. And I uh, wonder what happened to Joe. You out there, Joe Bell? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but um, so if that was a particular goal, within that goal, there's a lot of little techniques you can break down and work on, such as double stops, two notes, uh, triple, you know, three note chords, inversions. That's another whole technique you can learn. Uh, learning chord um, uh, uh, vocabulary, understanding why chords are called what they are. And uh, this is all kind of part of that particular technique that you can study. And then what, what uh, chord formulas. In jazz, everything is broken down into various numbers that, uh, for chords that relate to the scale you're in, like a flat two major seven or something. Um, that's a terminology that's part of the technique that you can focus on and study. And then there's all sorts of great books for um, learning chord inversions. That's a study. Uh, so you'll know when you've got something. You, you have to also um, keep in mind the amount of time you have. So if you've allocated like two hours to practicing, um, you may decide that all you want to do is focus on one aspect of the technique. Usually you, it can get a little boring and you can hit a wall. Uh, and it's helpful to kind of like work on another technique that supports this one. It's kind of like how your body assimilates food. You know, it needs the right balance of nutrients for all the nutrients to kind of like work together. Uh, I think that the, your, your evolution with a technique is kind of similar. So like if I want to get my legato playing together, uh, I'm going to practice other other things that help with that. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe that's helpful. All right. How are we doing on time? How long have I been going? Do you know, Steve? Uh, yeah, about an hour. Really? Uh, an say, hour? Hmm. I'd say uh, as long as you want, whatever you want. Yeah. Guys are getting bored. Let me see what some of these. How do you arrange your compositions? Do you write parts for each instrument? Oh, oh missed it. How do I arrange my compositions? It's based on the song. It's you kind of listen to the song and it'll tell you what what it what it needs for you. So a lot of people ask me sometimes, how do you know if it's going to be an instrumental song or a vocal song? Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I have to fight with myself, not fight, but, you know, kind of convince myself one way or another because a song can, for me, can work either way. So in a situation like that, um, I might think who the singer would be if I decided that I wanted it to be a vocal song. I prefer to sing things myself, but uh, my voice is extremely limited. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm not really a, uh, a singer by trade. But um, I like to sing. And I think when, when a melody tells me that it's right for my voice, I think I sound appropriate on it. Um, but if I hear something that needs Devin, <laughs> I ain't even going to try, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I can't, uh, I don't under, I try not to undermine the song. So if the song says, no, you need somebody else, you need a soprano woman a female soprano to sing this part. I'm not going to say, well, all I have is me, you know, because then I'm, I'm, I'm not doing service to my vision. Uh, I don't have the question written down, so I can't go back to it, but I have more here. Okay. Hi, Steve. I'd like to know if being able to play fast was a concern for you from the beginning or did it came to you later? Well, in the beginning, it was a big concern because faster was cooler. <laughs> At least that's the way I saw. I wanted to have, I wanted to rip. When I was 12, 13, 14 years old and I heard my heroes, I wanted to rip like them. Uh, there was two things that I seemed really attracted to that I can recollect when I look back. And one of them was uh, melody. I always loved melody um, and ripping. 
I like having control. I like in my mind, I wanted to be in control of that instrument. I wanted to, I wanted it to feel effortless. I wanted it to look elegant. I wanted to entertain people and fascinate them with, with what I could offer. You're allowed to think that way, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> that was in my mind. Now, part of me also felt like, yeah, but I don't know if that's going to happen. It wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a problem. And it wasn't a burning desire in the sense that I was going to mow over everything to get there. Um, but I did like the idea of being a boss, being a boss, you know, just having that thing in your hand and just feeling freedom, freedom all over freedom, not just with being able to play fast, freedom of melody flowing through you. So you really need to decide what it is that's attracting attractive to you. Uh, as I evolved as a musician and a guitar player, other things became interesting too, obviously. Uh, and when you get, uh, uh, maybe it's my age, you know, you're going to be 60 this year. <laughs> And uh, things like that aren't quite as uh, important as they were when I was younger. They're still important. I still like to be able to uh, connect uh, with the instrument, both physically and mentally. Um, but there's no, there's, I don't believe there's a right or a wrong to what you want. If you feel uh, many people, this is very, very common. They, they see shredders and that, well, they might see someone like me and I've, you know, experienced this my whole life. Uh, and they just don't, um, Sergio from Brazil. All right. Okay. And they just, they, they just don't get it. You know, they, they, uh, they, they're not attracted to that kind of violent, uh, aggressive sh shredding thing. That's fine. It's really okay. Uh, if you're enjoying it, that's fine. That's really okay. Um, the important thing I'd say is to not be wooed into thinking that you need to do something in order to fit in. Uh, that will always be destructive because it won't be authentic. You know, finding what you do fit into that feels natural, comfortable, organic, free to you uh, is, the, is, a, is the payoff. And so for instance, if you're, you need to develop the technique that's necessary for you to get your particular point across. So what I mean by that is some people may need to spend a lot of time on the guitar to develop their chops in order to express the way that they uh, express what they want, what they're seeing themselves, what their, what their, you know, note is, what their uh, joy is, you know, and for me, that was, it was a it was myriad things, but playing fast was one of them. I like it. I like the energy of it. I like, I just love it. And these days I'm not even fast compared to what's going on, which is fine. You know, that's great because that's just evolution that's got to happen. And it's, it's amazing to see, uh, and it, it inspires me too. little pricks. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, um, so someone, and I use this example, uh, someone like Bob Dylan, doesn't need a lot of guitar technique to get his point across. He just need, but he needs some technique, you know, same thing with John Lennon, but Carlos Santana has a different technique. It's maybe a little more advanced on the guitar. And then, you know, you've got guys like Alan Holdsworth, who his, his whole focus was melody and technique, you know, and, to say that he was wrong to do that is uh, sort of insane. Uh, so being brave enough to follow what your heart is telling you will always pay off. 
Okay. Okay, my main inspiration that keeps me playing and evolving with my music. Uh, sorry, okay. Have you had any haters <laughs> that made you want to put the guitar down when you were first, when you first started to play? Hmm. Well, my perspective of what a hater is has changed through the years. But when I was 12, 13, and I started to play, I, I don't think I had haters, but there definitely was cr uh, criticism. There's always going to be criticism. And I was kind of sensitive, you know. Um, of course, when you're growing up in a little town and people are you're a teenager, and there's other guitar players. You want to check out what they're doing, you know. See how see how you stack up, you know. And and uh, I learned so much, man. Every, it seemed to me like everybody was better than me. And some guys just had the best tone. They had great vibrato. They stretched notes in key. And uh, you know, all of this, I, I just was like learning and learning and learning. But uh, yes, there's people that cannot stand to see other people doing well. Um, it's a shame. It's, it's, it's a, almost like it's just an ego, ego disease. Uh, it's important not to buy into it. Um, I didn't pay much attention to any of that because I didn't really have haters. Nobody knew who I was. Uh, and once I started to play out, the first was like in college, well, high school and all that stuff. And sure, there's people that not not much, you know, but then in college, there's more of a curiosity, you know, and, and sure, people criticize, you know, they, they criticize because it's not maybe what you're doing isn't what they're doing. And, and you criticize in your mind, if you can, if you're sober enough to see, if you're mindful enough, I should say, you're criticizing. Um, but then when I started to, when I joined Frank's band, there wasn't really a lot of criticism because I wasn't, I was just a musician in a band. Uh, but then once I uh, obviously joined Alcatraz after Ingbe, criticism was overwhelming. <laughs> uh, and there was a period of time there, especially with uh, when I joined Dave Roth's band, this was before the internet, so haters, th that term didn't even really apply. It was, didn't really exist the way it does now. Uh, and I didn't see any of it because I didn't have access to it. Uh, there were magazines and people would write in stories. And the, probably the harshest period for me in the terms of being criticized was uh, when I was at the top of uh, my game in the 80s and playing shreddy and that kind of thing was was popular it got to a breaking point i think because guys like ingve and joe satriani and and others were just they brought it to such a level that musicians that would come that came along that may have more of what the, you know the bob dylan uh needs for technique uh not his attitude He's got a great attitude. Um, they would uh, uh, they would just start criticizing anything. They they didn't want to have to spend the time. They didn't see the reason or the need to have to be a virtuoso type player. So when it's and and frankly, it was just out of their reach. It was they, it was out of their interest, I should say, because if they were interested enough, they would have approached it. But then when the '90s came and the the grunge movement came in, it was like a grim reaper came and just hacked the head off of all the shredders. <laughs> and if you were a shredder, uh, it was kind of like a a bad word. <clears throat> and um, and it was just because the trend was changing. But then as the internet came along, you could read what was going on in people's minds. Uh, and even before that, before the internet, um, when that happened, that transition, uh, yeah, I was not in favor at all. The, the Steve Vai thing was, um, was used quite often as a target. And at first it was, it, it, it was, a shock because, and it was the best thing that happened to me because in the nineties I was, uh, 
with the early, you know the 80s and all that when all of a sudden you're on the cover of all the magazines and you're making all this money and everybody's telling you you're great and you feel invincible and like this is it the rest of my life i've arrived uh, but it's never the case because things are always changing and i wasn't quite maybe emotionally ready for that change so there was something that was uh, um, painful because I was taking it personally when every magazine I opened up, they, it seemed as though there was not one magazine that didn't have a, a hate letter in it directed at me <laughs> or using me as a, you know, and uh, yeah, it was difficult, but it didn't stop me. I couldn't stop it. It, it just couldn't stop. I couldn't, you know, uh, that, that my desire to be the we, the weird, quirky guy that I am, musician that I am, was just a little stronger. If I would have let it get to me, I would have just changed the way I played to make other people happy. That never works. <laughs> um, well, at least it never worked for me. And then the people that like what you do, they're not happy because you're not doing that anymore. So... I just put my head down and stuck to my guns. And that's when I made Fire Garden and Alien Love Secrets, Ultra Zone, all, you know, all, all the stuff that came. And the funny thing about history is it doesn't remember these dips in non favor, you know? Uh, and if you just stick with what's interesting and exciting to you, your strengths, it comes around. It, sort of, you know, it comes around. Well, for me, it's come around incredibly. I, I can't even believe the stuff I read these days. I mean, you guys, your comments, it's, I'm like, who are they talking about? <laughs> uh, so it's nice. But really, um, I had learned that uh, uh, opinions are just perspectives. They're just other people's perspectives and they're fine. And when you allow other people to have their opinion and perspectives without taking it personally, you're free. <laughs> and that kind of freedom, there's, there's no, there's no words that can explain it. You, you just have to feel it when you allow others to be who they are. And you don't, you don't take those things personally. They change with you your relationship with them changes. So if you find yourself coming across haters, forgive it. Just let it go. It's, it's not important. Now, if somebody's making a comment that's not very nice, but you keep seeing the same comment over and over, that might be cause for a pause. And to back up a bit and say, well, something, you know, you, you might be able to discover something about yourself that you can improve. But you'll know the difference between that. That's more of a critique. And critique is, is helpful. Critique is powerful. And I even look for criticism sometimes from people who are inspired critics, meaning they have some kind of an equilibrium and they, they can see things a particular way and they see your strengths they see your weaknesses and they might say, well, you know, on this record, he didn't really deliver the so-and-so. So if it's the right person, I might actually look into that and say, hmm. But uh, falling prey to hate is a terrible way to live. And the way you circumnavigate around it and actually change it is you don't offer it. You don't offer hate. You don't offer stabbing criticism. Uh, something very interesting that I discovered about criticism, it might sound kind of odd, but whenever somebody is criticizing something or hating something, they're actually only ever talking about themselves. No exception. I have always wanted to be your guitar just for five minutes. I can arrange that. <laughs> I know somebody. <laughs> you don't want to be beat on like that. Trust me. Okay. Hi, Steve. 
what such a beautiful song like Windows to the Soul is about. What was your main inspiration to compose it? Mm, thank you. That's uh, one of my wife's favorite songs. Well, um, part of part of when in, what went into writing it was like academic. I know I, I I'm very good at um, being able to find phrasing and melodic sentence structures in odd meters. I don't know why. It's just one of those things. So I love to write long solo sections that are in odd meters because when when you can phrase in, in an odd meter, it, 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 it has an, a, a whole different kind of uh, effect. You know, the, the sentence structures of your melodies are totally different. And I, I love that. And, and Windows to the Soul, I set out to write something and I, it took me some time. It was one of those ones that took a little time because I was toying with some really complex odd meter. And I'm just referring to the little arpeggio thing that's going on. I think it's an 11. Um, but 11 has a, when you're phrasing, when your inner melody, your, your inner melodic sensibilities are gravitating comfortably in something like 11.8, and this just takes practice. It just takes doing it and doing it and doing it. Uh, for some people, it might be very quick. For me, it, it took practice. But the feeling of locking to an odd meter, that doesn't sound like an odd meter necessarily because it's organic, uh, that's a beautiful feeling. And when I came up with that riff for the arpeggiated section and the chord changes for Windows to the Soul, I listened to it and I let the melody tell me what it should be. And I remember when I came up with that melody, da, 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 you know what it is. Oh God, it felt so good. I sat in the studio for three days and just played that melody over and over and over because it felt so good and it was a meditation and oh i'm going to put that song on the set list for the next tour it's really great to play it's hard <laughs> some of those riffs are hard but i uh that was the that was the initial inspiration but then the inspiration for the melody came by just listening inside and singing it. You just, there's a space in you that's open. And that's where all your unique creative ideas arise in you as inspiration. But you have to create that opening. And the way you do that is you shut off the thinking mind and you give attention just by kind of listening inside. It's a meditation, it's a form of meditation. But that's when, you know, the inspiration can arise. Uh, sometimes I'll fish around for things on the, on the fretboard, but they don't really yield the same kind of connection usually. Sometimes, but, you know, not usually. So as I was playing the song and the melody was unfolding and the vision for how I wanted to create the rest of the song started to emerge, I... Um, I then asked the song, what's your name? <laughs> and uh, basically it said windows to the soul. Okay. What do you miss most under quarantine? Love from Hong Kong. Thank you. I'm sorry to say, but it's business as usual for Vi. I live in this studio anyway, so I, there's not really much different. Uh, I'm, uh, of course, I know what's going on, and uh, of course, my heart goes out. Um, I'll probably talk more about this in, in, on Thursday, but what do I miss most? Well, uh, on Sunday nights, Sundays, uh, me and Pia and the boys get together, and we like to go do things. Um, and we couldn't this week, but it was fine because we stayed home and watched a movie. We watched ghost videos. 
uh, what else? It's, you can still go out. It's the same sky. And the sky is beautiful all the time, especially when it's raining. I love, we've had a lot of rain here in Southern California and it's gorgeous. We need it. I love listening to rain. Um, there's still all of the things I normally see in my backyard, the trees, flowers, um, studios the same, guitars are the same. What else? Well, one of the things that I'm seeing that I, I haven't seen that's a little uh, uncomfortable is the fear, the fear that people have, some, some people, and it's understandable. More on that on Thursday. Okay. Hey, Steve, do you have any plans for a follow-up to Vitiology? Thank you. Uh, and thanks for everybody who uh, <clears throat> found some value in that book. I so much enjoyed writing it. And I knew it was something, it was something I always wanted to do. And um, it did so well. I can't believe it. Uh, I mean, I may not be able to have a hit record these days, but I can have a hit book and boy, that one is one. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yes, I, I, I have a lot of ideas for some other uh, installments of Vitiology and they would be sort of um, topic specific. And one that I've been toying around with in my head lately is uh, something to the effect of top 10 rules for touring, because I've been touring for 40 years. And there's a lot of stuff I discovered that works and stuff that doesn't work. And I thought that it could be an entertaining, pretty funny book, but also very educational. It doesn't have so much to do with learning how to play the guitar. Uh, I'd love to do a, a series of, of ideologies based on guitar lessons, so to speak. I mean, the first ideology is no guitar lessons. It's basically sort of like a just a document you can go to to learn the, the terminologies of music and music theory. I'd love to do a, a ideology book focused exclusively on finding your own voice on the instrument. Uh, I'd love to do one on composition. There's so many. I'd like to hear from you. What would you like me to do? Hey, Stephen, let's look for some comments on that. I'd be, I would be interested to see what people would be interested in. Because for me, it's any one of them would be fun to do. Thanks for asking. Yeah, please, uh, yeah. How can I become a rock star like you? <laughs> Is that what I am? Ah, how do you become a rock? Don't expect it. <laughs> and you don't want to be a rock star like me you want to be a rock star like you and it starts here <laughs> all right where do you get your signature necklace and how long have you had it well it's not a guitar question and i for the first time in weeks i'm not wearing it because i left it in the kitchen uh, but that was made for me by uh, a lovely woman that I know. Uh, she's Italian. She lives in Sweden and she's a jeweler and she made uh, several of them for me. And she put so much love and care and attention into them. And uh, they're just very practical and they work great for me. And I just like them. And, and they, they remind me in a weird way of you guys, in a good, good weird way. So, um, I'm not sure if we're still kind of offering a link from vi.com to get to her, Lucia, to make them for you. But at, at one time we did. So she might be making them uh, still. Just look on the website for the necklace and Lucia. And uh, yeah, she makes great stuff and she can make one for you. Well, that's a lot. I don't want to start boring people. I have a lot of other questions here, but let me let me take a quick look at these posts. You guys are so great. Look at this. Wow. Are you sure you can limit yourself to ten rules? <laughs> I don't I don't know if I'd call them rules. <laughs> There's more like suggestions. Uh, new album anytime in the near future. No. I'm working on this orchestra stuff. 
and then I have a generation axed uh, stuff We're working on that. Uh, but the record is laid out. There's, uh, I know exactly what I want. I have all the songs chosen and I'm chomping at the bit so much. You know, it's funny because, you know, I sit here and I think, well, you need to be doing your record. And I find myself saying, yeah, but I'm doing this and I'm enjoying this composing and yeah, but I'm enjoying writing by theology. Yeah. But I really like doing the by camps or the generation acts or the, um, the jamathon, all these things take massive amounts of time. And in between all that, I, I start working a little bit. I look for, I, you know, I start uh, cultivating ideas from the infinity shelf and putting them together. And as of right now, and I can say it, but it can change. Uh, I'm very excited about getting back to work on the third installment of the Real Illusions trilogy. And this will really follow the, the story and the characters more. And it might be a, a, a record that's very heavy on vocals. Um, at this point in my life and career, I can't see any reason to hold back anything. Why? <laughs> you know, so thanks for that comment. A book of my crazy stories. Yeah, that might be Vitiology 32. <laughs> How much weight do you want? Um, I, I can't really keep these from, I can't read them because they're going by too fast. Ciao from Italy. How do you keep out of your head and stay in the music when you are playing? Oh. When you, when you are playing with others. Okay, how do you keep out of your head and stay with the music when playing with others? That's a great question. Uh, you listen to them and you don't comment. You just listen. So try this out. When you're, <clears throat> when you're approaching the stage or you're approaching the jam session or whatever it is, try clicking into this mode where you're hyper listening and observing what's going on as opposed to entertaining thoughts in your head about what you think you're going to do and how you're going to keep up and what the other guy is doing. Because what happens then when you, when you get into that environment, that that's getting out of your head, by the way, uh, by taking your, your attention can be in your head on thoughts or it can be in your on, it, it could be your attention could be focused on your senses, what you're seeing, what you're hearing. These are the two big ones, what you're smelling or whatever. It's hard to do, but you can't do both in reality, you know, and usually when the attention is in the mind on thoughts, uh, they're pretty willy nilly all over the place. Um, and especially in a situation where you're going to perform, they can be fearful thoughts. That's what nervousness is. Thoughts that you're thinking about the future that aren't real yet, <laughs> you know, or may never be. And that could be one minute into the future. And those thoughts are, and I know I've been through them all, you know, I still, sometimes I see them in the background. Uh, and those thoughts can be anything from, what are people going to think of me? Am I going to be delivering? Uh, uh, what are they going to write about me? Is this good? Do I, I suck? This I'm going to embarrass myself. Uh, I wonder what's for dinner. Uh, why is that guy playing this right now? Doesn't he know that I'm playing this? Or, wow, that guy can really play better than me. I'm, ooh, you know, this is all bullshit. And this is not uncommon thoughts that go through the mind. That's being in your head. It's not being with the note. It's not being with the music. Uh, it's an easy, simple shift to go from having your attention in your head, but you've got to recognize that that's where your attention is. Whenever you're feeling, whenever you're, there's thoughts in there that are, um, uh, the way you feel, the way you're feeling emotionally is your indicator of what the thoughts are that you're thinking. Because the thoughts create the way you feel. So if you're up there and you're feeling nervous or you're feeling frustrated or impatient or angry, whatever, or joyful and sharing, 
and clear. <clears throat> All these are reflections of the thoughts, so you can trace them to the thoughts. And when, if, you, if you can do this and you find that you're caught in your head, one thing that you can do that's, it's the only thing you can do. <laughs> that's really, that's, it's, well, I should say it's probably the most powerful thing you can do is you just take, you shift your attention into the immediate, your immediate environment, your immediate surrounding environment the sounds, the people, you're, you're seeing them and meeting them without any screen. This is a lovely way to be. It's, it's easy. You, you feel it immediately in your body, the, the releasing of resistance, the moment you can do that. But it, it's a little difficult at first if you're not used to it. It basically, you become present in the situation. And when you do that, you're connecting to the other musicians. You're giving them, you're allowing what they're doing to enter that intimate zone of um, connection. Because there's no criticism in it, there's just listening. And then if you can do that, you will respond accordingly. If you respond In a very reactionary way, that means you haven't cleared your mind enough. You're not present enough. And you'll know this once you become mindful of the way you're thinking. So you have to be able to recognize first when you're in your head and when you're in the moment that's surrounding you. And when you're in your head, you, you, cannot, you don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with the fear that you're creating if your thoughts are of that nature. But uh, for instance, I don't know what I'm going to play. Uh, 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 what, if you're talking about something in the future <laughs> and you're creating a fearful thought about it, you don't have a coping mechanism to deal with that. But if you become present in that moment that you're on the stage and you're listening, you have very good, effective, powerful coping mechanisms to deal with whatever whatever your whatever's actually really happening in your moment so you're listening and a response will come and if you're not criticizing your own response a more beautiful uh, um, communication happens i love uh, at my um vi academies i jam with all the students at some point and I mean, one at a time. And I love this because some of them are, are very accomplished and some of them are like beginners. But when I approach them, I just give them my full attention and listen. And the appropriate response comes out of me. You know, um, a part of me could be saying, oh, this beginner, now I can show everybody how I really shine. Ha, take this. <laughs> I, if I was in my mind, that might happen. But if I'm being present with this other person, then uh, something else happens that's a, a lot more um, enjoyable. And also, uh, it's important to be able to recognize when you're caught in your head, and I'm only limiting this discussion to you as a musician, but it holds true in anything. Uh, but as a musician when you can recognize that your thought patterns are not contributing to an enjoyable experience, matter of fact, they're making you miserable, uh, you need to know that the audience feels everything. Um, they do. Uh, what I discovered after 40 years of touring is the audience is there. They, they are connected to you. They know when you're faking it. They know when you're real. They know when you're when you're on. They know when you're not on. They feel it, right? <laughs> and uh, so let that be a reminder. If you're having a hissy fit <laughs> on stage in your own mind, the audience kind of they may not acknowledge it so um, obviously on the surface, but. It's the vibes that are being sent out that's 
that's more communicative even than anything you do. And you know this, you, you, you can be in a room with somebody and feel their, for lack of a better term, vibration. Uh, the question is, can you hold your vibration in the face of somebody else's uh, perhaps more reactionary vibration? So uh, if you find yourself, so the question was, if you find yourself, I forget what the question was, but uh, something to the effect of if you find yourself in your own head, what do you do? Well, the first thing is you have to recognize that you're in your own head. You have to recognize the fact that your attention is caught in myriad unnecessary thoughts that are running through your mind. Most people don't know that that's happening because they believe that they are their thoughts. So being able to pull back and give your attention to what you're doing. And this is fantastic when you're improvising uh, to just clear your mind and, and kind of get out of the way and let and, and just give attention to, it's hard to explain what I do. Um, when I'm performing, probably the thing that's going through my mind the most is, well, nothing, uh, hopefully nothing. Um, but if I find myself going off somehow, I can feel it. I'm becoming more and more in tune with the way I feel when I'm performing. And if I, if I feel something like this, I immediately give my, put my attention into my entire inner body and I relax it. Relaxing is so valuable. It's vital uh, because it, it gives you headroom. It gives you headroom to perform and to maneuver like an oiled machine. You know, if you're, if you're on the top of your uh, pushing game, so to speak, you, uh, it's almost like panic mode. You know, it's almost like a hysteria and you, you can lose control. But if you just relax, everything starts flowing easily. So this is a really good thing to experiment with. Try this. The next time you're, you're um, um, playing with somebody or you find yourself being nervous or you don't know what to play or you're on stage and you're caught in your head, take all your attention and just put it on the, into your body, into the, the – into the, mm, the, um, the, the inner energy field of your body and, and just relax, just relax, just take a breath, let, let your body relax with your breath and you'll notice amazing things that happen. It's, it, 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 it's hard to hold. I mean, for me, when I started doing this, it'd be like, wow, where did that come from? Gone, lost it. You know, because then I'm starting to, I'm, I'm getting in the way. But the more that I could relax and lay back, everything happens beautifully. And it's still a practice. This is what I focus on when I'm performing. And when you're in that state of relaxed allowing, the audience loves that. That's what you're there for. So uh, try that. See if that helps. Okay. I think maybe... Uh, Maybe I've spoken a lot here. I, I, I'm going to knock off now, Stephen. How long have, how long have I been going? <laughs> uh, okay, hour and 40 minutes. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Let me just read some of these comments. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. Uh Your soul is crying and it's glorious. From one of my songs, thank you. Play the guitar, please. All right. <laughs> okay. I'll just noodle around a bit. You know what I'll do next time? I'll set up uh, some little playback stuff because I'm just in this, I just got this little amp here. Right now. Well, this is uh, tuned down, but uh... Oh, 
Did you see it? Sorry. Okay, I'll play more next time when I'm warmed up. Listen, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm sure Stephen will tell me if this went well or not at some point, but I enjoyed it, and I'm going to try to do more of this. It's great. Good? Okay. I can tell you now. All right. I'm ready to go play some guitar. All right. Well, next time I'll warm up a little bit and play for you. Um, thank you so much for joining, and uh, good luck to you, um, and stay safe. Breathe in between the molecules. And uh, one of the things that um, I, I see so many amazing things happening right now uh, with this situation we're in. So many people are reaching out to give help. And uh, many people are connecting again in the home. And uh, all sorts of things going on. And I believe that when you look for the positive aspects of any situation that looks like a problem, you're destined to find a silver lining. And that is in no way meant to trivialize some of the real challenges that people are facing in the world right now. And my prayers go out to them. And uh, all right, we will see you on Thursday. Thank you so much. Bye.